All right. Thank you very much, Charlie, for such a nice introduction. Um, by the way, why you should join this Slack relevancy and matching? Because I literally got the invite from Charlie on Slack. So he reached out and he said, would you like to give a keynote? And uh, maybe this happens to you as well. So take your chance. Um, I bravely named this presentation as where vector search is taking, taking us, as if I know. But uh, during the course of past year, when I launched the vector podcast, I've learned a bit of things you know, from the makers, some of which are here today. Um, and I offer some of, some of their thoughts um, along the way as well. Um, just a bit about me, in addition to what Charlie said, um, I've been doing, um, well, search for about 16 years in various companies, um, including AlphaSense, which is now used by thousands of businesses around the world. Um, also worked on, 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 on one um, search engine, which, which was uh, kind of like a rival to Google, so uh, got a taste of uh, multilingual web scale search. And today I am a product manager at TomTom Tom working on uh, machine learning and relevancy. And I highly recommend you to subscribe to the podcast. There, there is a new episode with Doug Turnbull, um, really deep one, um, going into search, going into dance and sparse parts. Um, I've been also contributing to open source. Uh, my journey started with Luke. I don't know how many of you know what Luke is. Uh, today it's part of, uh, I, I see some nodding face. So today it's part of Lucene. Um, and really um, these tools allow you to kind of like not feel yourself alone on your search journey. And another really cool tool developed by Open Source Connections and Doug was the first creator, uh, the original creator is Cupid, um, which allows you to uh, run quality assurance on your search engine. And I've done some blogging on Medium uh, in dense vector uh, space as I was going through it and learning it myself. Um, so just a quick outline, I'll give you like a really short uh, report on, on the first season of Vector Podcast. Now we are rolling in the second season. Um, I'll show you a bit uh, in uh, kind of the, the gui guide in the search algorithms in vector space, uh, vector search space. Um, I also invented a vector search pyramid, uh, just not to feel that it's super fragmented space. So give, give a sense of uh, structure there. Um, I'll have a bit of use cases and uh, where things are going. So what's vector uh, podcast? Um, first of all, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it uh, on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts as well. Uh, so today there are 12 interviews. So it's like one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview with the maker uh, of, of vector search or maybe a maker in, in, in search uh, space in general. There are also two lectures that I gave myself in the University of Helsinki uh, where I live. Um, and another one was online. There are also webinars. There's one live recording, which we did. And I, I, I saw how hard it is to do uh, alone without a cameraman. Uh, and it's, it's, it's continuing. Um, some of the topics that we covered, um, vector database, obviously, VV8, Quadrant, Milbus, you know, many of these. Apache Solar also joined the, the, the group recently, right? Um, even though Apache Solar is not a vector database, it's a search engine, a uh, keyboard search engine. Vespa, Pinecone, um, then neural search in general. So uh, how you model uh, your use case without thinking, is it a vector database or some other building block? It's Gina, uh, Zero AI, uh, Haystack, coincidentally overlapping with the name of this conference. Um, there are also algorithms, a lot of them. Um, and I have one episode with Yuri Malkov, who invented HNSW, the, the most famous algorithm used today. Um, also embedding layers, sparse and search combination of things. Um, so it all continues. So welcome to, to, to follow it. I also wanted to do a bit of the interactive uh, part here. Uh, so this is a vector search players on the globe uh, of our earth. So what do you think um, who do you know in the states of, of the players? Any names? I know uh, VV8 guys don't want to say because it's a competitor, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, huh? Pinecone, awesome. And that's James from Pinecone. I know. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, there is also Zeri, which I just mentioned. Uh, there is also Hebium. And uh, uh, Milbus, which actually uh, 
transplanted from, from China over to the uh, United States. So it's like four players. What about Europe? Anyone? Say it. <laughs> Be Vivid, Netherlands, yep, exactly. There is one player in Netherlands. What about uh, Norway, anyone? Vespa, yep, exactly. It's a loud mouth there, uh, jo uh, Joe Bergum. Um, Germany. In Berlin, we have three players, right? It's Gina, it's Haystack, something else? Quadrant, exactly. Thank you, Rene. And Finland, I guess you haven't heard. I came from there, it's Mews. <laughs> and in Japan, we also have one player, anyone? No, it's called Vald. And it's also from the same company, Yahoo, uh, the same company that built Vespa. So as you can see, a lot of players are in, the Euro in Europe, uh, but also covered in Asia somewhat and Uni United States. But there is some secret sauce in Berlin that three players, major players are here. So um, as I was interviewing these makers on the podcast, what do they say? The recent uh, podcast with Malta Beach, City of Deep Set, um, uh, the company that works on Haystack, it's a neural uh, framework. He claims that in our industry, there is metric blindness going on. And what he means is that we tend to kind of, when it's an emerging field, we tend to first measure things and prove to ourselves it works in an offline setting before going to production because we are not yet there. Um, and the similar trend go, goes also in NLP community today. There is a recent paper uh, which surveyed, the authors of this paper surveyed NLP community and they found out that NLP researchers who enter the field tend to think a lot about what other people think. And that's crazy because when you enter the field, you should be driven by your gut or you should be driven by excitement that, that you are part, part of this field, probably also by some pressure from your supervisor, but not, not nevertheless. Um, and I think that this needs to go, this shouldn't stay. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't measure things, but I don't think we should be blind. Um, Joe Bergum is super loud mouth behind Vespa, but he shares a lot as well. Uh, he has uh, his own blog. Uh, they have Vespa blog as well. He says, don't sell hype. And it's usual that when thing, things emerge, there will be lots of hype going on, right? But don't sell it to your customers because this will come back and bite you. Um, Max Irwin, who used to work at Open Source Connections, um, decided to focus on something, some missing building block in this whole space. And that missing building block was, how do you compute vectors? How do you compute these embeddings? Because some of the models, for example, they may, they may have thousand uh, dimensions, right? And it's super expensive to run a GPU cluster for like five weeks. It's gonna cost you a ton. Uh, and you are just venturing into it to try it out. Why do you need to pay so much money? So he invented uh, Mighty, it's a web server, which uh, essentially computes the same embeddings on CPU with uh, the same latency. So you pay like a quarter of what you would pay or maybe even less. It has a nice talk on Berlin passwords as well. And also he cares a lot the about, about the community. He says that why vector search needs to be locked only to Python as it is today in many ways. And why is it locked to Python? Because it's deep learning, right? Um, and so he implemented a few uh, connectors to like Quadrant, and I think he was going to do this for Viviate as well, and for Pinecone, just to give people access uh, to these systems without, you know, changing uh, your, your favorite language, right? If you're in Java, you should continue doing that. And recently, Doug Turnbull, who works for Shopify today, he said, if I was to advise vector search players, I would, I would tell them, stop talking about yourself as a vector database because no one cares. Like when there are decisions made in product teams or I don't know, in sales or somewhere else in management, they don't think, okay, if I want to implement question answering feature in my, in my product, I know what I will do. I will pick a vector database. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. Maybe not now, maybe in 20 years, they will say like that, but not today. And instead he offers to switch to something like relevance oriented applications, because this is really is relevance, like recommender systems, search applications, question answering, all you do is relevance. But what about the market? There was a recent uh, 
study but by McKinsey and Google, um, which was published end of 2021. And it says that uh, yearly, just in the US, retailers lose $300 billion. Why? Because users stop searching. So they go on the website, they type something, they cannot find it, they're pissed, they leave, and they never come back. Uh, what's even worse is that 85% of brands are harmed. So brands didn't do any, any bad. They produce the goods, you've indexed them, somebody cannot find it, they think it's brand's problem, it's not your problem. And also, which is not so good, I think, is that 64% of US retailer website managers do not have a plan how to fix it. So now I think e-commerce is really, really old on the market and still there's like a huge opportunity. And I think vector search uh, is here to help solve it. Anyone recognizes this guy? <laughs> it's uh, from one and a half man support group. Uh, so this guy tells what is relevant. The root of this word is rel, yeah, we know that. Uh, but how does it pan out? So on the left, you see a more traditional approach to search uh, and that's keyword search, right? Examples are Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, Solar, and many others. Vespa, I think, does that too. Um, so it really relies on matching uh, the search terms in an inverted index. Inverted index is super old data structure. It's from 15th century. It's on the back of each book, almost each book. It's like the word and the page number. So uh, instead, in an inverted index, you have the word and the document ID, and that's called a postings list. So it works. It's precision oriented but it makes it very difficult to find similar things. So if you typed, each of us has, has our own uh, language, how we express things. And so if we type something similar, you know, there's no way you can find unless you craft a, a dictionary of things manually. Um, and also it doesn't suit well multi multimodal scenarios. So for example, if you have images and you don't have text associated with these images, how can you search it in, in, in Elasticsearch? I don't know how. Um, and here's an example. So if I'm searching for a bear eating a fish by a river, um, if, and, and I'm using BM25 or TFIDF, it's going to focus on some of the words. And, that, and that's how it's designed. So in this case, it focuses on the action, eating a fish, an object, but it, it misses the subject, which was the bear. Conversely, on the right, there's vector search approach, uh, which attempts to address this issue. So first of all, it utilizes neural network to represent object as a vector, and that's called an embedding. And what's important is that it's dense embedding. It's not sparse as an in inverted index. So dense means that in every point of the vector, you're gonna have a number. In sparse, you're gonna have a lot of zeros. And it's actually designed to return objects similar to what you typed, to what you're looking for. And, and so the same query here um, gets embedded into the vector. It's 512 dimensions. It returns a, another vector. And here is the, the image of the bear inside the river. You might still say it's not exactly precise, but you know it's similar. And it's, it's much better than on the left, I think, even though, though the image on the left is nice. Um, so this is the search pyramid, vector search pyramid that I started to uh, think about probably like a year ago. And I wanted just to put things into, into their buckets. And uh, uh, at the base of this pyramid, we have uh, nearest neighbor algorithms, either exact or inexact. So if you have a small set of vectors, you probably can do exact search. But if you have, I don't know, billion level or even more, even at millions, uh, you, you, you should use uh, approximate nearest neighbor algorithms. Um, and as I said, HNSW is one of the most uh, uh, famous ones, but there are others as well. And a lot of companies are working on this. And then the second layer from the bottom is vector databases. So they would not exist without this layer. And I will get later what's going on in this space, uh, how open it is, for example. Uh, and then the neural frameworks like Haystack, Gina, they actually rely on databases as storage layers, which internally rely on these algorithms. And off you go to upper levels where you need to pick a, a, a model, like an encoder, um, a, a way to embed, 
uh, like some kind of mighty or similar application and then application logic and user interface and a happy user. And how many players are in just the algorithm space? Quite a lot. Um, Spotify, for example, invented their own algorithm called Annoy and also open sourced it. Microsoft works um, specifically for Bing because uh, Bing is using vector search at huge scale. And so they would pay a lot of dollars to maintain this infrastructure. So they need to keep innovating how to save space and memory. Um, also Amazon, Google, Yahoo, obviously, they invented um, NGT, which is uh, one of the fastest algorithms for vector search. Uh, Facebook invented FIS. Uh, Baidu is also inventing things, Yandex, NVIDIA, and Intel, they all competed uh, in the recent uh, billion scale uh, benchmark. And this slide is just to scare you a little bit, <laughs> but just also to show you that there are a lot of algorithms and things get derived from each other, there are different classes of algorithms, you know, like graph based, uh, product quantization, uh, inverted file, and many others. It's like a, a ton of papers to read. Um, we also happened to work with my team, and Max Irvin was included in that team, uh, on um, a, an algorithm on billion scale. We were given an infrastructure uh, for free, and we could, we could go and invent something. And why I bring this slide here is because I think it's important not only to focus on use cases, but also on the roots, how you got here. So the algorithms are important. And what we did is that we invented a sort of like an extension of FIS. So we just changed the vector representation and then feed it to the FIS uh, layer and it does everything else. And as a result, we increased uh, in recall 12% on one of the data sets at about 20 million um, um, vectors. And essentially what product quantization is doing and this slide uh, comes from Pinecone, thank you, James. Um, so essentially a vector is as input has, um, has these many dimensions, it, it gets split into buckets. So uh, let's say M buckets, in this case four, and each of these buckets then uh, treated individually and, 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 and clustered and, and we'll lose precision as a result of this, but we also gain in uh, storage. Um, what we did is that we, look, we, we took a look at the data sets we were given. We didn't know how these data sets were produced. Um, we only had the binary representation and vector, uh, in vector shape. And we plotted uh, essentially correlation, right? And, and we've noticed that there are some patterns here. Um, I believe the darker it is, um, the, more, um, the more correlation there is. So we, we, we realized that Vector uh, dimensions are not independent. There is something going on there. We also used uh, variance inflation factor to turn things around, just to actually spot some of the really uh, outstanding correlations. And uh, as a result, we shuffled them in such a way that more similar dimensions would be grouped together and less similar uh, would be in some other group. And that gave us 12% improvement. So you don't need to invent an algorithm from scratch. You might, you might actually uh, do an extension of existing algorithm. And I encourage you to look into this if you, are, if you, li if you like mathematics like we did. Um, and then on that set, same topic of product quantization, essentially what it does is that if you have a query that comes in and you have two, object, two objects in your database, uh, product quantization, uh, and they are very similar, they are close in space, product quantization will actually map them to the same point in space, so you're going to lose precision, and that's why you need to do a re-ranking step after you retrieve these vectors. And it's somewhat similar because it increases recall and loses precision, it's somewhat similar to stamming, in my opinion, if we were staying in the, in the realm of uh, sparse search. Uh, except, um, yeah, stemming handles a lot of uh, word forms, except the last one, right? Because there is no stammer that can handle past, uh, past term, past tense. But um, yeah, we can live with that. All right. Uh, so, what is the motivation for vector search? You know, in some ways, you could say, why do we need it? We have BM25, TFID, TFIDF, we can survive with that. But as I said before, you cannot re really easily Im index images or audio or video or some other object that you might have, like email or something else. Um, and also, can you go multimodal, meaning that you type a query in textual form 
and you find an image or maybe a song. And you might say, yeah, it's still hype. Uh, where is the proof that this works? Track is one of the most famous conference, uh, conferences competitions for search engines uh, around the globe. And uh, for the past almost like 20 years, there was barely a change, right? So like there was one winning um, algorithm and, and barely you could see somebody doing, uh, moving, moving a needle there. And then in, in, in 2018, there was a paper uh, about uh, attention is all you need. And then in 19, we got like all these transformer models like BERT and, and so on. And all of a sudden, we started to see a huge increase in, in uh, uh, search engine performance. So there is suddenly hope that we can do better. And quickly, yeah, you probably know this, uh, but vector search is a way to represent and search your objects uh, in multi-dimensional geometric space. Um, and all of the vectors are dense, so you rarely have zeros in these vectors. This uh, uh, image is from uh, Cortes of BB-8 uh, docs, uh, where you can see that if I have apple and banana, you know, close by, which are fruits, and we know they're fruits because they occurred in the context where this induces this as a fruit, uh, they would be also close in geometric space. And uh, conversely, if you have something else like newspaper, magazine, article, these would also group somewhere else in this space. And that's why intuitively this works. Um, and what can it do in practice? So for example, if you uh, have a query, what is the capital of the, of, the, of the United States? By the way, it's not how you search if you wouldn't expect this to work, right? You would type maybe capital United States, you wouldn't even form the query or question. And so if you would still use the keyword search retrieval, you would find hits like capital punishment, it's death penalty in the United States, or um, Ohio is one of the 50 states and it has a capital as well, like every uh, state. And also Nevada is another one, right? So you literally didn't get an answer. In vector search approach, it actually focuses on context a lot. And also it, it, it applies attention mechanism to know that the capital of the United States is Washington DC. It also pulls a capital, uh, but that's fine because it's also there. Then how do you do this in practice? For example, one of the methods that you can apply is you can combine query and document embeddings in the same model. And this is called the bind coder. Um, and then you compute a cosine similarity and essentially you spit it out in your search engine uh, results uh, list. Um, cool, so you will have to do this upfront and then you get a query and you, you do the same. Uh, Neil Ramos is, really famous guy in this space. Uh, he does a lot, he shares a lot as well. Um, he also brought up things like vector search maintains word order. So something that in, in sparse search, you will have to do using phrases, or maybe you need to implement some near family in Lucene or something like that, depending on your search engine. Uh, in vector search, it kind of comes for free. So for instance, if I'm searching visa from Germany to Canada, you know, it wouldn't return me the opposite hits, which I'm not interested in. And this was proven by both Bing and Google when they launched vector search uh, improvements. It also knows about related terms. If I'm searching for uh, Spearman correlation NumPy, but there is no NumPy hit, there is a SciPy hit, it would, it would pull it up. And you can do things like multimodality and multilinguality. So for example, um, uh, on the right here, we have the picture of zwei Hunde im Schnee. Sorry for my German, I'm trying. Um, you could type that in German, you could type that in English, you could type that in Chinese and still find it. Uh, because there are models that can embed into shared representation, which is kind of language agnostic. Um, since we're in Germany, why not mention beer? This is one of the famous uh, papers called uh, Benchmarking IR that I highly recommend you to read unless you haven't read it already. It basically tried to do zero shot predictions. So they took uh, all of the you know, uh, famous algorithms in dense retrieval and uh, they basically just gave different data sets to these models without fine tuning. And they took a look at how it stacks up. And, and what turned out is that 
BM25, which is sparse search, is very, very stable uh, baseline. A lot of methods just don't really work if you do not fine tune them. But there, there is still hope. So the top, the leader on the left, far left, is a uh, BM25 and cross encoder. The only gotcha there is that it's super expensive. It's much more expensive than BM25 for sure. And second from the left is a doc to query approach. And this is something that you can try without venturing into vector search, uh, like heads on, like without implementing a vector database. Um, what you do is that you take your document, you run a doc to query algorithm, which produces uh, queries that this document may answer. And then what you do, you take these queries, let's say 50 of them, you index them along with your document body, and then off you go, you can search, right? So when users type something similar, you have higher chance to find this document. And it also was proven to work better than BM25 in uh, 11 data sets, 11 use cases. Another thing to keep in mind is that when we create this community, we might be a little bit like fragmented. And I heard uh, hybrid search. It's a hot topic today. So we want to combine sparse search with dense search. How do we do that? And I heard only of two methods. One, linear combination. Another one is uh, RRF, which is reciprocal rank fusion. So essentially it just looks at two systems and it pulls them one by one. Uh, but turns out there is a lot more methods here and I have a link to the paper. Um, it does say that RRF is one of the most stable and best, uh, but they also say that the last method, which is um, uh, rank biased clusters, it actually is more general than RRF and maybe it will work better for your data set. And that's why knowing about these methods is important and trying them out as well. So let's go back to the search pyramid. How does this uh, ecosystem stack up? So we covered algorithms, we covered vector databases, which are using these algorithms. We have neural frameworks, which are relying on vector databases, encoders, application logic, user interface, and the user. Now, how much of this is being shared? So the algorithms is like 100%. You can find all of the papers, except just few which you probably wouldn't even care. And also they're using like um, building blocks that exist in the open. But as you move upper, and I think Charlie actually uh, cited this on the last uh, Haystack conference in the US, there's only 71% open. Some databases prefer to follow another model and that's totally fine. That's business reasons to do that. But it does have an impact on the community as well. And it doesn't mean that these people do not share things, but they share them in a different way. As we go up, neural frameworks layer is even less open. Despite the fact that Haystack and Gina are open, Zeri, I, Habi, a feature form preferred not to be. And I have a hypothesis here. As you move closer to the user, you probably tend to close things up. And maybe that's because we are just in the beginning of this journey. Maybe later this changes, we don't know. Um, guess what? If we go one level up, you would think that this model should be open, but no. Clip model is closed source and there is a clone of it on GitHub. GPT-3 is closed source. Not even to say that the data is not available to you. The model itself is not available to you. Of course, you can read the paper if you want. Um, BERT, I was actually surprised when I went on GitHub, it is actually open, but the last commit was probably a few years ago. And, and, and the recent one was just tweaking some script. Maybe it's just ready, it's done, but I don't think so. Um, so really not all vector databases are made equal and this just hides the title <laughs> a little bit, um, but you know, I spoke to all of the makers in this field that I knew, and yesterday I learned from VV8 guys that there are more coming our way, so that gets exciting. Um, and yes, as I said, 71% of them are open source, 
they choose a variety of different implementation languages like Go and Rust and Java and C++ and some Python. And some of them we don't know, but I presume probably one of these language. Um, many of them use HNSW, which is a graph algorithm invented by Yuri Malkov and his co-author. Um, but some also use or allow you to index your data using other algorithms just to compare. Maybe it works better. What about neural frameworks? Uh, in neural frameworks, 67 is open source, um, and they have different focus areas. For example, Haystack from DeepSet tends to focus a lot on NLP. They also started experimenting with multimodality like image search. Gina doesn't restrict themselves to NLP, so they, you, you can also do uh, automatic speech recognition related applications and so on. Um, but many of these are NLP still, because NLP is very big. Um, use cases. Um, I don't have too much information about this. And again, this goes back to how much things are getting shared. Uh, but I do know that, for example, one of the interesting projects is called Google Talk to Books, something that I dreamt about myself, that you can find something that you have in your memory, but you don't have the title, you don't remember the authors, and you can just type some, you know, some memory in your head. And you can basically talk to books, which is really cool. There is another one, also uh, an episode on the, on the Vector podcast, uh, car image search for classic.com. So you can find uh, images of cars, which is super cool. Um, and list goes on and on. Question answering, of course, you have multilingual search, which we did in, in, in Muse, uh, or you can do image similarity with clip model. Uh, you don't need, uh, you know, textual part of the image, which is, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, a little bit more, oops, I'm sorry, a little bit more broad use cases list is something like metric learning that Quadrant is big with. So the problem is that when you take a model, it might not fit your data set and you need to fine tune that models in some you know, affordable way. And so metric learning is really a way to go or a try at least. Also semantic search, of course, when you type ride sharing, some applications will turn this into a long Boolean query to enumerate all of the different terms that pertain to ride sharing. But maybe it's uh, complicated and it also you will be behind the wave. Um, and so vector search uh, can help there. Anomaly detection and classification, of course, and multi-stage ranking when you can, you can retrieve your documents using sparse search and then re-rank them using more semantic search. All right. Um, I thought I would give you a demo because this talk wouldn't be so cool or interesting without a demo. I hope you guys see this. Um, yep. So uh, you can build this today at home if you want uh, from open source components. You don't need to use uh, you know, only uh, paid software or something like that, which is nice. So what I can do here is that I can type uh, a query like, let's say, red dress. Let's imagine that this is an e-commerce search that doesn't work today. So um, yeah, so here I find some dresses. Uh, they look okay, I guess. Um, what if I try this in Finnish? Uh, so Punainen means red uh, and Metko means dress. Um, now look what I get. Uh, the reason is that I don't really have titles in Finnish in my data set. And this data set is 10 million images with captions uh, mined from the web. As you can see, I do get some uh, mentions of Punainen, which is red, but it really misses on the point that I'm searching for the dress. Um, let's switch to image search, which doesn't do any text matching at all. It goes directly into the image using the neural framework, framework uh, neural network. And, and here you go, you get uh, images of dresses. I think this can change the future of search. Um, and, um, but, but I still believe we need to find a, a, a useful way to combine things together. Um, also, to remind you, no matter what search method you choose, remember to evaluate the quality. And Cupid is one of the open source uh, systems that you can, you can try. Um, you can maybe use some uh, closed source or whatever, but do remember to do this. Um, 
and invite your uh, human annotators because the experts, they will tell you how your search engine should work. And you will remember this here, and then you can change your algorithm, you can change your approach, come back to it and, and see how, where it stands. As promised, where things are going. I think hybrid search will continue to boil. So we will see something. Uh, I highly recommend you to take a look at Vespa's talk on Berlin buzzwords uh, this year. Um, Gina has a lot of demos on, on combining things. For example, you can drag uh, like a slider and it pays more, uh, gives more weight to text and less to image or vice versa. And you can see how it pans out. Um, efficient embeddings is going to be crucial for launching this in prod. You wanna save uh, time, of course, latency related item, but also cost. It's super expensive to do this on GPU, uh, you know, every single time. Every time you change an algorithm, you need to rerun this. Um, going multimodal, I think uh, multimodality is still somewhat undervalued and I think it will see its light. Um, and you can search inside really interesting objects like, uh, I don't know, audio, or you can, uh, you can blend things together. You can search in 3D objects as well. Gina has as, as, as a demo on that. Also, uh, model fine tuning and selection, you know, read the beer paper. You will understand how these methods, are they stable, are they generalizable or not? Um, also play with various fine tuners. You know, you, you can pick a model, you, you have your data set, you can fine tune it on that data set. Um, you can also not concern yourself with fine tuning. Sometimes you can pick a pre-trained model like we did uh, in the demo that I sh just showed, we picked clip and it worked just fine. It's just that it doesn't work sometimes. For example, we, we picked Amazon data set from 2014, where people would take uh, pictures with their like, uh, you know, crappy cameras, so to say, and it just didn't work. So yeah, of course you cannot swap a data, data set in your business domain, but you can uh, maybe try another model or, or not consider vector search in that case. All right, um, you also need to, to choose a strategy for how you go uh, towards vector search. You know, will you add a new vector database or not? If you have a, let's say Elasticsearch or OpenSearch running, or maybe you can use the dense search functionality. Or maybe before that you can try doc to query. So you just index more content and see, does it actually work? Um, yeah, and also MLOps, uh, machine learning operations is going to be super important because search will turn more into data science than it is today in many places. Um, and so you will need to apply this rigor of A-B tests and offline evaluation and other things. And I will leave you with this uh, projection, so to say, into the future from Andrew Ang, who believes that multimodal AI is here to disrupt the, the many dom domains, including search. And in each of these modalities, like NLP uh, search, uh, NLP um, voice and, and computer vision, we have accumulated a ton of knowledge. And now there is time to cross these borders. And I think this will happen. You can also get practical if you want. Um, this uh, repo is open. This is the baseline for all my blog posts. Um, it supports Solar, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, uh, also like some closed uh, systems like GSI, um, virtually any model that you can pick from Hugging Face or any other, uh, you know, model hub. Uh, you know, if you want to get your hands dirty, go, go and try it. And of course, subscribe to the Vector Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. Well, to kick us off, I mean, I did ask Dimitri, you know, what he'd talk about, and he, do, he didn't tell me. So this has been a surprise to me, and it's been a very nice surprise. Thank you very much, Dimitri. So uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, we also have our online folks joining us. So uh, if you're online and you've got a question, please type it into the Zoom chat, and we'll attempt to interleave it, because obviously interleaving is cool, uh, with questions from the floor. So does anyone have a question for Dimitri? Um, so, so you mentioned, um, yeah, th thanks for the, for the keynote, it was very inspiring. You mentioned a lot of uh, initiatives and a lot of uh, like uh, new projects starting around vector search around the world. Uh, and um, 
they, they are kind of starting from scratch. It's a new, it's a new thing that's, that's being creating right now. Uh, do, do you think that the traditional search engines will also like come or come back with their own version of, of vector search, their own uh, implementation? Uh, yeah, do they yeah. still have a chance in this area? And yeah, how? it's an excellent question uh, because it shouldn't feel that way that there is a new wave that's going to kill all the previous players. It's not going to happen, by the way. Like, for example, solar is used by like hundreds of thousands of businesses, if not millions. So I think that, first of all, this already happens. And it's a great question. Solar has added a dense, first they added a dense field, and then they added a ANN implementation based on HNSW, thanks to Lucene committers. And the same functionality is available in Elasticsearch. And also OpenSearch now considers implementing this on Lucene level because they have done it so far off the hip which is C++ implementation. Um, so yeah, these players do ca catch up. And also if you take, let's say Vespa, uh, Vespa's approach, and there is an episode with uh, Joe Bergum on the podcast where he goes deep into this, they actually implemented vector search as kind of like afterthought. They first mastered the, the keyword retrieval. They figured out the recommender systems and only then they decided to go to vector search. And this of course uh, gave them a new wave and, and attention from the crowd, which is awesome. But you still need to stay on the ground and do not sell hype to your customers. Yeah. Fantastic. Do we have another question on the floor? Hi there. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, Mighty being a technology which is essentially embedding using CPUs with a similar latency to GPUs. I was wondering how that's possible and what the differences in the technology and functionality are. Yeah, that's a great question because it does sound like magic. Uh, but essentially, uh, Max is using, using uh, a technology from Microsoft called Onyx, which is, I don't remember what it stands for, but it basically cross uh, you know, language uh, representation of your, your neural network. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, essentially, it, it kind of optimizes in a way that you know you get closer to to the binary, right? So and and away from these abstractions that might be too costly to 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 operate with. And so and then it becomes also language friendly. So for instance, instead of using only Python, you can use Java GNI interface to load the same model and essentially operate within Java without implementing another layer in your complicating your your architecture, right? And introducing un unnecessary latency. So I think that's that's the approach to take. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Dimitri? So maybe from uh, I have one question. Do you have some recommendations to create maybe roadmaps to implement vector search for an e-commerce? Like for, what for is e-commerce? For e-commerce. For e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. To be honest, I would start, um, of, co of course, if, if you have the engineering crew, and I have um, another a presentation where I go deeper into this, sort of like a, a solver, like let's say where you are, where you wanna be. Um, and so if you have the engineering crew, then go and try some open source uh, framework or database. Um, there are plenty. Um, if you do not have a crew, I would recommend using like a managed uh, system, like for example, Pinecone is similar. Um, also be, be careful with choosing a model, right? So let's say if you wanna go multi-model, let's say it's, it's very uh, prevalent in e-commerce that you have, an, you have a product and then you have some, some product description which might not even be relevant, right? It's like brand description or something, but you really want a description of the pro what's in the image, right? Like colors, texture, and, and so on. Um, try clip on that, right? Uh, run a test, be rigorous about evaluating, choose a metric with which you will evaluate, like offline metric, right? Uh, usually like I choose NDCG, but there are some, uh, some people who say, no, I don't like NDCG because it cuts over the list and you don't know, it's not global. So you should choose uh, maybe DCG or whatever. Choose a tool to evaluate like Cupid or similar. Um, also figure out how you will compute the embeddings, right? This will become your bottleneck, really. 
Like when we tried to re-index 10 million images, we decided not to go for it. We just abandoned it. We took the vectors from Leon uh, data set, right? Because it's super expensive to compute for 10 million images, uh, 512 dimensions in clip. Um, and on, only later, after you figured out all the use case, that the use case works, think about which query will go to this new system and which query will be continuing to be served by keyword search. And you can blend these things, but you could also implement a query classifier. So you could say, if this query comes in, it's too, too short. So it just says, you know, the shoe or whatever. You don't want to find a similar product that looks like shoe. You, you, you don't want a socks, you want shoe, right? So that's important. Um, and then observe in the logs. Uh, for example, in the episode uh, with Malta, uh, working on Haystack, he, he noticed that in the logs, they noticed how, how gradually searchers switch from keyword to dense, uh, to dense model because they've noticed that it works for their use cases. Okay. So we've got a question from our online uh, folks, um, which we now have a um, hundred of, which is great. Um, Stuart Cam asks, outside of FP, FGP, I think he means FPGAs, but anyway, FGPAs. <laughs> Do you see a future with specialized hardware for vector manipulations, similar to, say, Bitcoin specialized mining hardware? It's a great question. Um, first of all, in the demo that I showed, uh, we, we used a hardware accelerator uh, built by GSI. So the idea is that you can have, a, let's say, elastic search cluster and a plugin that talks to this specialized hardware. And what it does, it's like a tensor in memory. So it indexes all of your vectors in memory and, and it, it, and it uh, operates on bit levels. So they convert all of the vectors, let's say floating point to bit level representation, zero, zeros and ones, astonishingly losing lots of precision, you would say, but it doesn't happen. Uh, they lose a bit and then it gives them like a huge advantage on computing this on bit level architecture, which was designed specifically for this. And it works on billion level. So I think APU, it's called APU, Associative Processing Unit, and they claim it to be in the same family as like CPU, any, anything that ends with U, right? So like GPU and then APU. Um, they've been competing with NVIDIA and Intel and NVIDIA produces GPUs, right? So uh, they were super close. Like in terms of latency, they were like millisecond to each other. In terms of uh, recall, you could still, still do improvements, but I mean, they, they were fairly close. So I think hopefully answering this question, uh, you know, yes, there is future for specialized hardware in this space. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and thanks for your questions, Stuart. And everyone online, do think of questions for our presenters and we'll ask them on your behalf. So, and uh, Stuart says, thanks. Right, um, I think we're going to leave it there. I'd like to all give a, a huge round of applause for Dimitri, the fantastic <laughs> keynote.